Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's launch. Uh, let me start with a, a couple of logistic points uh, for this session. Uh, the event is recorded and will be available uh, for public consumption after. Uh, please use the Q&A tab uh, to send us your questions throughout the session. So we have a, a couple of presentations and then the panel, but please uh, don't hesitate to, to use the Q&A. Uh, to share your questions uh, during those uh, presentations as well. Uh, we will also be inviting you to participate to two polls, uh, and it's the same type as the Q&A to the right at the bottom of your screen, uh, so you'll be able to, to play with that. Uh, my name is Laurent Bodusso, and I'm the Senior Spectrum Director at the GSMA. Uh, I look after spectrum policy and regional engagement. Uh, and I'm really delighted today to, uh, to be with you for this event. Um, in a few minutes, we'll be launching our latest report and insights, which focuses on IMT mid-band spectrum needs up to 2030. As you know, we always aim to provide as much information as possible with regards to uh, our spectrum needs. Uh, this is to support, obviously, policymakers to make sure that uh, the right decisions in, is included and incorporated in their spectrum roadmap. This report has taken quite a few months uh, of work and uh, thank you very much to, for the team for, for this excellent piece. Uh, I would also like to thank you for joining us today. Um, and you know, looking at the agenda, you can see that broadly uh, today's sessions will be divided into two uh, main areas. The first one will be focusing on what the demand uh, for spectrum will be and uh, we will get an overview of the work uh, that has been done by Coliago Consulting. And the second part, looking to understand how we can work towards meeting this demand with a, a really good panel uh, discussion. Uh, we'll also use the panel session to address your questions, so don't, don't worry about this. Uh, next slide, please. We know that uh, 5G will require spectrum in low, mid, and high band. I think everybody is very familiar now with this, but we have prioritized our effort at the moment on mid-band uh, due to its importance uh, for 5G, but also its you know, very specific characteristics. Uh, it is clear that MNOs are really keen to provide uh, a wide range of services to the industry and to the public. Uh, and as 5G penetration increases, identifying sufficient spectrum in mid-band will be a challenge. So the GSMA will be here to work with you at national level uh, to find solutions. Before handing over to our experts, I will now launch the first poll. Uh, so it should appear on your screen. And uh, the question is, and I think it will appear in a few seconds, uh, the question is which uh, mid-band uh, will be the most deployed uh, for 5G by MNOs by 2030? I will, you know, we'll close the, the poll at the end of the presentation from Coliago Consulting. You have a little bit of time to, to think, but it should be fairly straightforward. Now, I would like to welcome Stefan Zello, the CEO of Coliago Consulting, and David Tanner, the yeah. managing consultants at Coliago. Um, Stefan and, you know, David, many thanks for, for your work over the last, you know, seven-ish months, I think, uh, and for accepting to present the report today. Uh, so, uh, can you please tell us now how you have estimated the IMT spectrum needs for mid-band uh, in the 2025-2030 timeframe, please? Over, over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Laurent, and thank you for inviting uh, Coliago to uh, present this report. Uh, the starting point for estimating the demand for spectrum is really 5G and the requirements of 5G. Uh, the world has signed up to 5G. The uh, capabilities are defined by the ITUR, and you can see them here. So notably, we see that massive increase in the user experience data rate, that's a factor 10 in increase to 100 megabits in the downlink and 50 megabits in the uplink, and then also area traffic capacity, which is a massive hundredfold increase in what 5G must deliver compared to 5G. So IMT 2020 is expected to provide a user experience matching as far as possible that of fixed networks. 
Next slide, please. And comparing 5G to 4G brings us to another factor. 4G is essentially people with smartphones. 5G is about so much more. That is also fixed wireless access, a huge number of non-human devices connected to the network, and really, really low latency and reliability, which is a, a, a step change compared to 4G. So 5G vision is really for fiber-like user experience. Next slide, please. With those step changes, it is easy to understand that also a step change in the amount of spectrum required is necessary. So on this slide, we are showing how spectrum is being used. Operators need a balanced portfolio of spectrum. And the focus of this report are the, is the mid-band spectrum. So we have the lower mid-band, which is already largely assigned, and then the upper mid-band in the range 3.3 to 6 gigahertz. That is what's required to deliver the user experience data rate in cities and also in higher density traffic areas outside cities. Next slide, please. The demand for spectrum is driven by traffic density. So the problem really lies in cities. This is where mobile operators face the difficulty to deliver the promise of 5G. So our model starts with the ideal requirement of the user experienced uh, speed of 150 megabits in the downlink and uplink respectively. We use population density as a proxy. After all, it is people with smartphone, but also smart city and other applications are where people are. So that is reasonable to use population density as a proxy. Of course, not everybody and every application will require 100 megabits uh, at the same time or simultaneously. So we introduce an activity factor which represents a simultaneous demand in a given cell. So that's a concurrent demand from human and non-human use cases. The mid-bands don't have to carry all the traffic because operators will deploy millimeter wave sites outdoor and there will be small cells indoors. So with that calculation, we can estimate the traffic demand per square kilometer measured in gigabits per square kilometer. That defines our area traffic demand in cities. Next slide, please. Now, what of the capacity supply? Of course, most cities already have a fairly dense network using macrocytes, uh, and these tend to be sectorized, three sectors, all of the spectrum is deployed on it, and it's a fairly good spectral efficiency. Uh, but what we will see is an increase uh, in outdoor small cells, so that will increase area traffic uh, capacity supply. So we assume that there will be a deployment of three outdoor small cells for each of the macro sites, investment in MIMO upgrades, and eventually by 2030, all the spectrum will be reformed 5G. That gives us our capacity supply per square kilometer. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, there we are. So we have applied that model to 36 cities around the world. Uh, how have we selected this city? These sample cities all have a density cluster of at least 40 square kilometers, and many have many more uh, square kilometers of dense area, up to 200 square kilometers. So that's a really, really big area to cover uh, with small cells. Uh, and there are many of these cities. We only looked at 36, but uh, looking at the uh, makeup of uh, urban environments around the globe, we estimate that there's 626 urban areas with clusters of at least 40 square kilometers with a population density of at least 8,000 per square kilometers. And these cities can be found across all ITU regions. So this is an issue everywhere. And the populations in these cities amount to 1.64 billion people 
And that really provides uh, an illustration of how useful assigning or allocating additional spectrum to be used to deliver 5G in cities would be uh, from a socioeconomic perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so our model shows that despite the investment on the supply side, building small cells, minor upgrade, uh, migration to 5G, uh, you do need an additional mid-band spectrum. Um, the amount of spectrum varies a little bit. Uh, we used a GDP or income as a proxy, particular GDP per capita. So high income cities, we will of course have more smart city, higher 5G adoption by 2030 and so on. And the spectrum demand for mid-band spectrum is in the range of 1,260 to 3,690 megahertz. And that key driver, what responsible for that difference is population density. So the higher the population density, the greater the demand or need for mid-band spectrum. Uh, as you can see, the demand for spectrum is also high in upper and lower middle income countries. Again, uh, with population density being the key driver, and despite having make, made assumptions that uh, 5G and 5G the traffic demand won't be as great in lower middle income countries as it is in high income countries. So there is really a concern that policymaker may not be aware of the challenge they are facing to make available additional spectrum to deliver the 5G vision in their cities. Next slide, please. Um, of course, you might ask, well, how about more cells, more small cells? Well, yes, we have already uh, taken that into account in our model. But densification beyond what we have assumed is highly problematic. It is difficult from a technical perspective, from an economic perspective, and also from an environmental perspective. The more sites you have, the greater the power consumption. And that, of course, is a key issue uh, if you think of the uh, problem the planet is facing in terms of global warming. In other words, it is really uh, an environmental issue and to allocate more spectrum to re reduce energy consumption. Um, next slide, please. There is, of course, as we all know, a large amount of millimeter wave spectrum or high band spectrum uh, in the range of 26 gigahertz or higher uh, being made available for mobile. It's already specified. It's, it's these are three GPP bands and the amount of spectrum there is measured in, in, in gigahertz and not hundreds of megahertz. Uh, you might say, well, can't I use this? The answer is high bands are not a substitute to additional mid bands and that is because the propagation characteristics are so different. Yes, they will be useful because they'll carry some of the traffic in the most dense traffic spots. So the millimeter wave densification approach would not represent a viable option, yet millimeter waves are required to uh, serve areas with extremely high density, uh, traffic densities. Next slide, please. Now, you've seen the numbers, you might say, well, is this reasonable? Um, in fact, when you make these calculations in the model, it's in a model, it's always good to stand back and say, does this make sense? The cities in our samples, uh, we show that the area traffic density is in the range of 300 to 500 gigabits per square kilometer. Now, if you compare this to the ITUR requirement, of 10 megabits per square meter, and we uh, translate that into gigabits per square kilometer, we'll find that the average across the city we are calculating is only three to five percent of the requirement uh, as defined by ITUR. So that's, of course, the average across the city. It should be lower, but as you can see, three to five percent, that is really not aggressive. That is quite modest. Well, how about that very high area traffic density? Um, you can see here a London bus. Uh, 
the area of a London bus is 25 square meters. It has a passenger capacity of 80 people. If only 10% use video, and those of you who are familiar with London traffic jams and the boredom of commuting and sitting on the bus, only 10% using video is, I think, a very low assumption. And we make the assumption they only use 4K video at 20 uh, megabits, again, which is not a lot, given that you can already on an iPhone get close to 60 uh, megabits. The area traffic demand is 6.4 megabits per square meter. So this is not far off the 10 uh, megabits per square meter as defined by ITUR. So this tells me that the assumptions we have made are not only reasonable, if anything, they are rather modest. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, right. Uh, so the, the demand drivers for uh, mid-band spectrum is driven by both in cities as well as small towns and villages. Uh, we talked about cities. These are areas with high density and uh, countries with extensive FTTA coverage. This spectrum is really required uh, to deliver uh, mobile broadband because fixed needs will be served by fiber. But in villages and rural small towns, the additional spectrum is extremely useful to deliver 5G FWA as a far, far lower cost than building fibers, because building fiber in rural areas is very expensive. In countries with a sparse fixed infrastructure, uh, additional spectrum, additional mid-band spectrum is not only useful for city-wide speed curve coverage, but also for 5G FWA. And of course, this is also the case in rural and uh, small towns uh, and villages. So without one to two, three gigahertz of additional mid-band spectrum, the urban-rural digital divide may widen rather than narrow. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, so to summarize, the benefits of additional mid-band spectrum 5G depend a little bit whether a country has extensive wide broadband or fiber and countries without extensive fiber. And you can see just by glancing at this that you can see more ticks, more green ticks for countries which have limited wide broadband. Because really in many, many countries, particularly in Africa, Southeast Asia, and also Latin America, uh, wireless broadband, including 5G wireless, is really the only game in town. So to summarize, the benefits are the economic delivery of a consistent data rate, 100 megabits in the downlink and 50 in the uplink, ensures that fixed wireless access broadband is a long-term solution, and then for countries in emerging market with limited broadband access, the lower cost for urban FWA overcomes the lack of fiber and DSL broadband access. Uh, in both types of countries, it improves the rural FWA economics to bridge the urban-rural digital divide. And in emerging markets or lower income countries, the additional spectrum, the additional mid-band spectrum helps to deliver the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So that's particularly important, I think, for Africa and Southeast, Southern Asia. Uh, and, and this is important both in developed and emerging markets, uh, the additional spectrum would be used to deliver connectivity, the right sort of connectivity along busy highways and railways. And lastly, it would uh, contribute to matching or reaching the ITU and UNESCO Broadband Connection 2025 targets, which are not just defined in the number of people that are connected, but also in terms of affordability. And that is really the key. Uh, affordability is very much related to the amount of upper mid-band spectrum that is being made available. Next slide, please. Oh, well, let me summarize the key findings anyway, if you can see it. So uh, the total mid-band spectrum needs, when averaged across all the 30 sites, cities we examine, are in the range 
of uh, two, uh, 2,220 megahertz in the 2025 to 2030 timeframe, and in areas below, and that is in areas with a population density above 8,000, looking at areas with the population density below 8,000 additional spectrum would also deliver benefits, which are either a lower site density or higher speeds. And a lower tight site density, of course, uh, translates into a lower cost per bit, that is the affordability issue, as well as lower overall power consumption, so the green issue. And in uh, uh, lower income countries, the availability, availability of additional bit per spectrum would enable operators to deliver fiber like 5G FWA to rural towns and villages. Uh, in countries, of course, which have good urban and suburban broadband infrastructure, the key use of the spectrum would be uh, for uh, connectivity or bringing down the cost of connecting the remaining unconnected rural towns and villages. For example, in Europe, uh, there would be a 79% cost saving or cost reduction compared to FTTH in rural areas. And outside populated areas, the spectrum is essential to deliver uh, proper 5G uh, for connected vehicles as well as trains. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Um, it's I, I think we're we're catching up on on the slide number, so we should be nice now. So I think thank you, thank you so much, Stefan, for this presentation. This report is going to be available uh, in a couple of minutes, so uh, bear with us on that. We'll we'll give you the link uh, in a few minutes' time. As you can see, you know, uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, the four customers. You know, uh, Stefan and his team have been working for, for months on this, and um, we have ensured that only uh, realistic scenarios were considered. So, for example, it is based on density of population. It does not include tourists and commuters in these 36 cities. Uh, same when looking at a business park. You know, MNOs will be providing connectivity to the industry. Uh, in a park, but uh, from a, a population density point of view, uh, a business park is, seems to be at zero. So, um, so we're not working on uh, on the worst case scenarios. And uh, you can check. So, if we go to the next slide, you can check the uh, spectrum requirements ranges uh, estimated for the 36 cities globally. Uh, but to keep it simple, you know, as Stefan said, you know, a total of you know two gigahertz of spectrum. Is needed on average, you know, pending fiber rollout, uh, as well as millimeter wave spectrum usage. Uh, so th there's a lot of conditions there. Uh, but this additional spectrum will allow 5G download and upload speeds, uh, but also allow, you know, uh, up to six times more homes to be covered uh, with fixed wireless access. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's quite quite a big quite a big step, you know. If less spectrum is made available, then the INT 2020 requirements cannot be met. Of course, you know, as Stefan mentioned, we have also looked at the possibility of densifying the network, uh, and it was concluded that cost of deployment would increase by a factor of, you know, three to five times. Uh, and in any case, densification alone will not compensate for the lack of spectrum. I think, you know, densifications will, as, uh, as Stefan mentioned, increase the energy consumptions by a factor of 1.8 to 2.9 times, but also realistically, you know, deploying such a high density of additional sites in the cities uh, will be very, very difficult, if not impossible. And of course, it would lead also to to self interference due to to lack of spectrum. So, uh, in any case, uh, that would also generate even more spectrum. Uh, it is therefore paramount, I think, that we start looking at ways to secure spectrum, and you know, obviously, WC23 uh, has a role to play on this. So, on next slide, please. In conclusion, I think on on the basis of this work, we really recommend that uh, we work together to find ways to secure, on average, two gigahertz of mid-band spectrum between 2025 and 2030. Of course, uh, at a national discussions with operators will be required to clarify the specific targets and roadmap to achieve it. 
uh, this discussion should you know take into account the demand for 5G take up uh, in the country, possible uh, use cases uh, which are prioritized, uh, population density and fiber rollout. Then uh, support the allocation of harmonized spectrum such as uh, additional spectrum in 3.5 gigahertz, uh, 3.8, uh, 4.2, 4.8 and 6 gigahertz. And I can see from, from the poll already uh, that we are closing now. Uh, that as a result, I think 3.5 seems to be uh, the first uh, major band to be uh, foreseen to be used. And of course, it is the first uh, kind of 5G band that was uh, made available in many, many countries. But you can see also behind 6 gigahertz, we know that uh, WRC23 will be discussing uh, the identifications of the upper part of 6 gigahertz. Uh, but also some countries like China have already decided to open up the full band for 5G. 2.6 is interesting. Uh, obviously, uh, often used for 4G at the moment, and we will see, obviously, in some countries to try to accelerate deployment. Some of the operators been able to do kind of uh, dense uh, spectrum sharing, if you like, where they will be able to carry 4G and 5G traffic uh, over 2.6 gigahertz. Uh, and and, and 4.8, obviously, uh, at, at the back at the moment, because we've not really spoken uh, just yet uh, too much about this band. So, you know, I hope that you are now looking forward to downloading these documents. Please bring up your phone camera to scan the QR code, because uh, the link to this command is about to be shared. Uh, so there you go. Here are the reports uh, produced by Coriago uh, Consulting and our insight report, which are uh, available for you to download. Please take them, read them, and, and speak to us uh, and provide your comments to us uh, and speak to the mobile operators as well uh, so that we can work together on this. Uh, this concludes my intervention, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague Luciana Camargos. Uh, Luciana is the Senior Director for Future Spectrum at the GSMA. Welcome, Luciana, and you know, can you please tell us now with your you know, incredible panel how you're going to find two gigahertz for 5G in mid-band. Over to you, Luciana. Thank you very much, Luha. And um, this has been uh, very interesting to, to see the presentation from Coleago, but also the um, the conclusions presented by Luha. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in a moment, I'll be introducing our fantastic panel of experts to discuss our different plans, and we hope our common vision. But first, I would like to draw your attention to our second poll. We're opening our second poll. And um, the second poll is about how will 5G FWA impact your market? So please go to the poll and, um, and vote. And well, I'll share with you at the end what is the re result of the poll. So for an, our next slide, please. Um, harmonizing mid-band and low-band spectrum has always been one of the major challenges in planning future mobile connectivity. There will never be enough low band capacity. That's just the law of physics. And the mid band spectrum that is ideal for city wide connectivity is in demand from mobile as well as from other sectors. This slide shows many of the mid bands that are already being used by mobile and some that are planned in the future. Lower mid bands are saturated with earlier generations and only 1500 megahertz is often available as a development band. Um, you see that 3.5 gigahertz is the 5G launch band. 80% of commercial 5G launches have been made using spectrum between 1 and 6 gigahertz, and the majority of these are in the 3.5 gigahertz range, as we saw again from the result of the first poll. At WRC23, we'll look at new bands, including 4.8 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz, on top of the 3.5 gigahertz. Um, today, we are discussing spectrum beyond 3.5, the launch band. We're looking at the future of 5G. The GSMA has a vision of 5G by 2030, and we're going to ask our experts how we can meet the demands of that vision in mid-band spectrum. So over to our panel, if we can go to the next slide, please. Our panel uh, will each make an opening intervention before we move to a group discussion of the ways in which we can meet mid-band spectrum demand. It's my honor to introduce the panel. So we have here Mohamed al Mogazi from NTRA Egypt. We have Eric Fournier from ANFR France. We have CK from Axiata, 
And also we have Massimiliano Simoni, our GSMA SSMG chairman, who works at Telecom Italia. So right now I'll start asking, uh, I'll start by asking Mohamed to make his opening remarks. So Mohamed, over to you. Thank you so much, Luciana. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, I'm very honored to be part of this panel today, which comes at uh, a very timely manner. I can see many familiar faces, uh, my dear friend Eric, which I'm, I'm sure he and I are missed today at the TG61 uh, meeting, which is currently discussing the future use of, uh, of UHF. Uh, Luciana, Luciana you, you're also our boss at the ITU, as you are uh, the chair of the group responsible of, of 1.2. Uh, having said that, I think the report examined and discussed today a very critical issue for the future of, uh, of 5G in the mid-band. And certainly, it deserves a lot of attention from our side as it accommodates a lot of valuable details. Uh, I'm sure such a report will support our discussion uh, at the ITU when it comes to I, uh, IMT. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohamed. I'm now moving on to Eric. Eric, please. Hello, Luciana. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Thank you, Luciana. And um, uh, thanks to uh, you and to GSMA for this opportunity to provide our views on, on, on this panel. Uh, thanks also to Coelago for the presentation of, of this report. It, it's quite interesting. We, we, we don't have we all comment on the conclusion of, of the report. It, it's in line with what EU member states have indicated in their SPG opinion that additional spectrum needs is mainly for mid-band, so that's uh, converging here. Um, of course, we all know that there's no magic figure such as uh, one or two years or, or the, uh, all, all, all these figures. Calculation are always sensitive to assumptions such as on, on base session density. Um, uh, I, I really welcome also in the Corrego report the element concerning the additional cost and the environmental impact of the uh, uh, additional uh, base stations or the increase of base station density. So that, that's very interesting and we'll have a look on, on that. Um, uh, then, of course, there will be a need at some point of time to discuss about solutions in terms of, of spectrum and that's where spectrum managers are, are working with my, my friend Mohamed. Um, so we, we, we have, and that's our difficulty of the job and the interest of, of the job to, to manage competing needs. That, that's clear, or, or various services application. So in Europe, we succeeded in making um, available the 3438 for 5G, and that, that was nice, 400 megahertz in the mid-band. It's clear that the other mid-bands which are quoted in the, um, uh, in the polls, such as uh, 3334 gigahertz and the 4.8 gigahertz are not available in Europe mainly because of military use, and this will not change in the foreseeable future. That, that's clear. So we all know, and I think that will be part of the discussion, that there will be a focus at WRC23 on the 6 gigahertz, uh, 6.4, 7.1, and, and we are supporting studies in this band. We are open uh, to any uh, conclusions, but, but you should not be mistaken. The more difficult issue is not really the fight between Wi-Fi and, and 5G or 6G in the uh, 6 years. Um, that, that's not the real one. The real difficulty is, is to find some convincing solutions to address the production of satellites which are receiving in this band from cumulative interference of base station. That's not something which would be dealt with nationally. This is an international obligation and it will be at the core of, of this item at WRC23. So I did not see yet any study on this matter. WRC is in two years, so it's it's urgency for you, for operators, for spectrum manager. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to attend this panel. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, on that point, I I will use my hat as chairman of Agenda Item 1.2. Um, we have not conducted any studies yet. Uh, we just actually. Uh, finalize the characteristics for IMT systems, and we actually haven't received any characteristics for satellite systems, which we're hoping the responsible group will be able to provide to us by the 23rd of July. So I think um, we're looking forward to these studies starting in October, and uh, with the collaboration of uh, everyone involved. 
but thank you very much. I think it's a very good point. Um, moving over to CK. CK? Yeah, thanks, Luciana, um, for having me on this panel today. Just for the participants, I, I work for Axiada, and we are a telecom uh, group uh, headquartered in Malaysia. And we have operations in 11 countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia. So happy to be here. Uh, for me, this topic of uh, mid-band spectrum is twofold. One, of course, is the length of time any spectrum block gets uh, identified and come onto market and put into a good commercial use. That takes a long time. In fact, in some of our markets, the 2.6 gigahertz band, imagine if you believe it or not, is still uh, not locked, is still not available for IMT, even after so many years of it uh, being identified. So we do have a long, uh, long uh, pathway to get uh, bands up and uh, available. The second is the issue of the pandemic, and we see this quite, quite, uh, quite obviously in developed markets, developing markets. Sorry, uh, in Malaysia, for example, our consumption for mobile broadband has doubled year on year. So everybody is uh, moving into online world. Schools, school children uh, get their education through the internet, and we have so many complaints, but because of poor uh, of service quality uh, dropping, because everybody's loading the network. So, and, and even when there are periods where the lockdowns are eased and people go back to the offices, the, the consumption doesn't really uh, go back to normal. So people have normalized their uh, way of work. That means they are, they are comfortable doing things online, shopping online, doing stuff online. So it makes, uh, yes, for the last year and a half, in most of our countries, our networks are super stressed because of the added uh, load. And we see 5G as being one of the solutions uh, to, to so-called uh, make things uh, easier, elevate the issues. And of course, the other thing is that uh, with a lot of people on onto the onto the networks, the price that we sell have to also be uh, affordable because that is also the uh, perhaps this other other part of where our stakeholders uh, expect us to do right. So balancing these two things, a loss of demand, huge demand, and being able to sustain our business model. I think 5G and uh, maybe to bring more 5G uh, services on the market, uh, including identifying future bands to, uh, to look at future demand. That is uh, two big things for us. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, CK. Uh, well, last but not least, Massimiliano, over to you. Thank you, Luciana. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, uh, some, some of the things I wanted to say have already been said, but uh, I think it's quite important now to to hear to to underline the fact that uh, um, well to to evolve uh, uh, the um, and upgrade the 5G networks uh, to make it make them cap capable of of providing the the full benefits of 5G. We have seen that we will need a spectrum in three ranges in the future. Uh, in the the low band and the high bands are in some way covered because for the high bands there are already some some tuning range and such. Uh, on top of, of the existing 26, 28 gigahertz band. In the low bands, we have the WRC23 uh, uh, agenda item that will try to find out, uh, let's say, some, some uh, solution, flexible solutions for, for farther spectrum, if any. We will see what come out from WRC23. And so uh, what remains is the mid bands where we uh, are deploying our networks. We have started to deploy our networks in those bands. And we have seen from the Coleago report uh, uh, that there will be, a, uh, let's say, we will be very hungry of, of meat and spectrum in the future. Uh, there are also possible ways of, uh, the alternative ways of, of finding, of, let's say, trying to, to overcome this spectrum shortage in these bands. Uh, one way could be to upgrade the existing previous, uh, the, the existing technologies that we are using in other bands. Uh, so refarming them, this is something that operators like we are doing uh, uh, already. Um, the, or sharing between different technologies with uh, something like uh, uh, that is uh, something some features that are called uh, DSS, dynamic uh, sharing uh, between technologies. But these have some uh, requires time first of all um, for some reasons. There are some obligations, regulatory obligations on some bands. Uh, roaming agreements sometimes, uh, IoT legacy contracts in place, uh, uh, delay in updating the e-call service, uh, and finally also the, the customer base that has that has to be migrated in, in, into new bands and technologies. This is just to say that this, this uh, upgrading process 
we require time, uh, we require years. For some technologies will be faster, for some others will be slower, but in any case will not be enough. We know that. Therefore, we have to find out some brand new spectrum. That's what, what we are doing here, uh, more. we're trying to do here, more or less. Uh, we have envisaged already identified some possible bands, the six gigahertz, the, the upper, uh, upper four. On all of these, uh, from our point of view, present some advantages in terms of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, bandwidth available, availability of bandwidth to, to let's say, provide the enhanced uh, um, 5.5G or 6G uh, performance that we will see in some years towards the end of the decade. But uh, uh, the, 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 we also foresee a lot of problems, as it, as it has also already been uh, highlighted by, by Eric, for example, uh, on, uh, let's say, possible alternative uses for these bands. And the risk that we see is that in case the new spectrum uh, is not identified in mid-bands, uh, the, the results from, from the operator's point of view will be that the, the network will grow slowly at a slow grow rate. There will be higher congestion peaks and, and the congestion rate will uh, increase, especially in densely urban areas. Uh, this will translate, uh, will turn into a, a lower uh, quality of service or quality of experience, as it is, as it is sometimes referred to. Therefore, well, an overall degraded performance of our networks. And the only possible solution in those cases will be to densify the networks and um, making them more, well, bringing the reuse of frequencies at a very high uh, um, rate, at a very high rate. Uh, final remarks is that this, this process of, of densification has some problems. Um, I come from a country where the, where the EFM, EMF limits are well below the recommended uh, ICNIRP levels, and this means that uh, even if we uh, we identify new spectrum, we will have an, in, an inevitable um, densification of sites due to the uh, space saturation, the EMF space saturation in those countries. Therefore, the uh, um, the, the lack of uh, mid-band spectrum, further mid-band spectrum identification will create a further densification on top of the already planned densifications that will happen, not, not to talk about a uh, uh, small cell, for example, that will happen naturally. And last but not least, uh, this also has a new, as it has been also uh, highlighted by, by the presentation from Coleago, uh, we will have a, a big impact uh, on the um, energy efficient of our, uh, efficiency of our, uh, of our uh, sector. Um, we have some tasks in Europe, but not only in Europe, uh, some uh, tasks, specific tasks to, to fulfill and to uh, uh, get the, um, to, let's say, uh, gr have a greener uh, network, and this will not be possible in, this, in those cases. And we will also not contribute to the one of the 17 sustainable development goals. I think it's uh, it's all for the initial remarks from my side. Thank you. I'll turn back to you, Luciana. Thank you very much, Massimiliano. Um, I'll start now the questions um, with, with the four panelists. If people would like to post questions on the system, we will go through um, audience questions later. But I do have some questions for you guys. And, and if, if I could get started with CK. Um, I think, CK, you, you did mention, you did reference Coleago's report. Uh, there's a potential growth in traffic for 5G. Do you agree with this view? How useful is this type of forecast for you in your markets? Yeah, thanks, Susanna. I think forecasts uh, like the ones that uh, Coleago has done is certainly very useful. I remember in many years ago, ITU study groups also did something similar, and that paid for the uh, administration to use uh, in the spectrum planning for 4G. So I remember that that was quite some time ago. And we see now those administrations which actually adhere to those forecasts and consider those forecasts uh, and brought those bands, 4G bands, to market at the right time. We see all, we see actually the consumers benefiting because the, span, the bands could then be deployed to commercial use. Uh, people like us would then build networks accordingly and, and then provide good service, good QoS service. And sometimes when we see uh, other markets which perhaps because, uh, fall behind in terms of that uh, target uh, bandwidth right, available uh, to be to be uh, to be achieved, we see uh, there's a huge structural 
uh, limit to what they can do in terms of uh, the network uh, capabilities. I'll just give you an example, right? In Malaysia, uh, we are reaching about 26 GB per user per month. It's huge. I think one of the uh, open signal uh, reports just about last, last month showed that among smartphone users, Malaysian consumers use the most, uh, most uh, second highest in the world, right? And uh, this is because our markets are developing markets. Uh, quite in contrast with uh, developed markets like Singapore, where I, I believe the average uh, mobile data consumption is around 6 to 8 GB per month. So about a third lesser than Malaysia. And it's because in the other countries in Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, even Bangladesh, there is very little fixed infrastructure available. So when people have to turn to the mobile network and smartphones as the primary means of getting to the internet. And that means uh, each uh, technology like 5G is so important in the future, that even now in the future, because it means that we can deliver more uh, with what little we have here. Yeah. And, 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 and things like reserving the spectrum, the mid-bank spectrum for unlicensed use, sometimes may not work in developing markets because uh, that unlicensed use means uh, understanding that it must be predicated that you have a fix, a sizable fixed network then you put in your uh, access points and you blast the Wi-Fi, right? Uh, so that, that infrastructure we don't have. So therefore, if you do allocate a lot of uh, spectrum or the band or unlicensed, then you actually uh, may be short-changing ourselves. Yep, thank you. Back to you, Luciana. Thank you very much. And I'm, and I'm going to be directing questions uh, to the full panelists, but if any of you would like to address the question, I ask someone else, please do, do, do come forward and that's absolutely fine. Um, I do have a question. My next question is for the regulators in the room. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. How do the figures in the report tie in with your existing plans for meeting 5G demand? Um, what are your concerns with reaching 2, gigabit, 2 gigahertz of spectrum in the mid-band range? So any, any of you, Mohammed, Eric, both of you. Mohammed, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Luciana. Uh, actually, it may not uh, be well known, but Egypt was one of the first, uh, perhaps, Arabic and African countries to try to estimate the future spectrum requirement back in 2010 and 2011 as uh, part of the Egyptian broadband plan at that time. Uh, I was part of that team who developed uh, some sort of calculator. And uh, I looked last week at our estimation and certainly at that time, it uh, made a lot of sense to us, given that the data was uh, provided by ourselves and the estimation criterion was modified and uh, optimized to meet our needs. Now looking at the report under examination today, certainly the report confirms the general trends of needing uh, enormous amount of spectrum to meet the demand of 5G. Such trend I think cannot be questionable. And what's useful about the report is that it provides us with a general overlook on the amount of spectrum needed. So everybody agrees that more spectrum is needed for 5G, but what is useful about the report is that it gives you some range. Uh, perhaps it's among uh, or between one and three uh, gigahertz. So generally speaking, the report confirms uh, the understanding that a lot of spectrum is needed at different bands. To this end, I think what, uh, if I may say, missing from the report is that these data need to be validated by each country in terms of the timeline of uh, evacuating the spectrum, uh, some uh, specific assumptions that were used in the report, uh, especially the activity factor, which I believe is different uh, from country to another. Also, the, the, the density. When I see, for instance, in the report Cairo, uh, for us, Egyptian Cairo is three main governments with uh, 20 million population with a lot of different uh, assumptions. Therefore, I think the report is, is, a, is a very good start. It's, uh, it comes at a timely manner, but it, it needs some uh, re-examination uh, of the data from our side to uh, confirm the results and perhaps uh, provide more accurate 
uh, estimation uh, at least uh, to meet our uh, short long uh, term thank you lucia thank you very much and i think the idea is that this report is out there and people will have will be able to look and to review and to look into their um excuse me into their data internally and we're certainly hoping to work together on that i don't know if eric would like to touch that question yeah yes please uh um more or less like uh, what what Mohamed has said, we we always go shoot with a figure like uh, uh, two or three figures, uh, which would be uh, necessary. We know that there are assumptions, and in in this uh, in this respect, what is really very interesting is this assessment of what would be the consequence of having less spectrum available in the midband for 5G. So in terms of uh, uh, environmental impact and in terms of, of course, for operators. That, that's something which is really useful and, and which can be, of course, adapted to, say, national circumstances. Uh, we, we don't have exactly the same traffic uh, all over the uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, having said that, uh, clearly one, one response would be, obviously, the possibility, and that's already existing in Europe, of all existing mid-bands, so all bands above one gigahertz, uh, to be used for 5G, that, that's clear. And in total, then you have something in Europe which is somewhat one gigahertz of spectrum. There's still a big gap, it's clear. That's why we are uh, interested in the study in the six gigahertz, because 3.3 and 4.8, no way in, uh, in, 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 in Europe, in, in my opinion, and it's also, of course, a perspective <laughs> from my side. So we are interested in this upper six gigahertz. That would correspond to 700 megahertz of spectrum, which is quite quite a lot. It would be a big uh, bunch of, uh, of spectrum. That's Thank all. you very much. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think that's why we're studying it, and that's why it's in the agenda <laughs> of the WSP. Um, now for Massimiliano. Uh, Massimiliano, there have been times, and I would say around WRC 15 is definitely one of them, where the operator community became extremely concerned about the spectrum shortfall. What's the mood in the community now in the MNO sector? Are we reaching another moment like that? Uh, yes. Yes, Luciana, thank you. Just before answering, just a quick, very quick comment on Eric's words. Uh, I believe that uh, if I don't want to, let's say, uh, stick to a European uh, uh, debate, but uh, if we talk about uh, what would happen in terms of what would happen if we do not uh, uh, identify enough spectrum, I try to, to also to, to highlight in my initial remarks that it will it will come up with less performance networks, with higher costs for operators, not only for operators but also for the service itself, therefore on the societal cost as well, and the slow take up of of of, of uh, networks. And in in a one in a moment where there are some let's say political ambitions to fill the 5G gap that we have in Europe now, compared to the Europe or to Asia, I think that would be one uh, uh, negative result. That is, the, the result would be also to let's say the uh, um, lack of fulfillment of this this political goal. So probably uh, uh, there's also this one this this to be considered. Uh, coming to, to Luciana's questions, yes, uh, um, um, as I was trying to say, the, the shortage that we see is in, especially is in the mid, in the mid, in mid band range. Uh, we have enough for the time being identified spectrum in the millimeter wave bands. We have an, uh, let's say also a second, uh, uh, tuning range in the 3743 that has been already envisaged. Therefore, there is, a, um, a spectrum to, uh, let's say to uh, uh, enhance and to uh, let's say arrive to the second phase of the 5G deployment. Uh, in the mid bands, there we we have a problem, uh, and we see that uh, as as uh, IMT as mobile networks require a harmon harmonized spectrum, uh, uh, the the problem is that the the different solution that may be uh, envisaged in each country may not be the, well are not the solution uh, uh, we live now in a globalized world in terms of, of, of uh, uh, telecommunication and therefore we have to first identify the bands we understand that in some countries not all the ranges uh, harmonized will be available but the first thing that we believe it's uh, um, something that cannot be uh, 
missed is the opportunity to have this band harmonized for bands. When I say these bands, I, I mean the six gigahertz and the upper uh, upper four gigahertz. I, I agree, I understand that there are still some difficulties. The, the question of the compatibility with satellite that has been mentioned, uh, we will perform the studies and we will see, we, will, we, we hope that to find, to be able to find out maybe uh, uh, solutions uh, not only with low power network, but maybe with uh, mid power network with some exclusion areas. Uh, if we, if you consider that already the lower, the, the, the existing 3.5 gigahertz have this kind of solutions uh, in place. So probably a similar thing could also be applied to the new bands, but it is important to harmonize them for uh, IMT. Otherwise, um, there will be no possibility also for countries that are willing to open these bands up. Thanks. Thank you, Massimiliano. And, and with that, I'll jump into uh, WRC23 discussion, which is close to my heart. Um, and, and that's to any of you in the panel, and Eric has touched that already, but what are the main barriers to harmonization for the WRC23 mid-bands, 3.3 to 3.8, 4 h 4.99, and 6.45 to 7.125? Uh, having said that, I think it's important for us to understand in the mobile community, we would love to have worldwide harmonization, whatever we could. It was great when we talked about uh, WRC 2000, 2007, when everything was worldwide harmonization. I think we've moved on from there. The different um, different challenges in different countries, different countries deal with different challenges in different regions, socioeconomic and everything. But what do you see? So what are the main barriers to you for WRC 23? Again, 3338, 48499, Six four two five seven one two five. Anyone? Okay, maybe maybe I can start. Uh, WRC twenty three is also uh, sweet. My heart. <laughs> so, but uh, <laughs> the the difficulty in harmonization is is a difficulty in say uh, incumbent use. And when you have some incumbent use which are uh, on on ships, aircraft, uh, which are uh, massively uh, used in, in, in some countries, and that, that may also uh, apply in some countries to uh, the uh, satellite use in C-band. That's not the case for Europe, but that's the case for some, some African countries, for example. That's, that's the difficulty. I mean, if not, if we could, uh, say, manage the spectrum from scratch, we would, I hope, uh, all together in the world, find a single table which would be more or less applicable to everybody with only some, some just small difference to take into account difference in terms of, of needs of, of, of countries. But all that after uh, more than a century of radio regulation, we have something which is a, a complicated puzzle. So we have to do with that. That's what is making sometimes interesting the concept of tuning range, which has enabled 3436 more or less as the uh, core band uh, for, for the mid band. In Europe, we are going up to 3 gigahertz, and maybe some countries uh, will be able also to go up to 3.8 gigahertz. In some countries, in particular sub African, uh, African, sub African countries, there are also some possibilities to use uh, 3334, and that's something which I think the kind of solutions providing certain level of, of harmonization. I think for 8, for 9, and that would be uh, more difficult, very clearly, I have to be uh, frank. And for 6 gigahertz, one of the difficulties, obviously, that it's only a region one, uh, but obviously, I think that if we find a solution, <coughs> that could be for the whole region one. And of course, we know that some uh, countries outside Europe, I could mention China, are also very much interested by this spectrum, Chinese market, that that's a big one, so I think it's uh, it's also uh, in the direction of, of some harmonization. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, any other takers? Mohammed, please. Thank you, Luciana. Uh, I will take another aspect of the issue. I think one of the main uh, problems that we're facing right now is with regard to the procedures for virtual meetings since the start of WRC 23 study cycle. I'm, I'm personally concerned about this, and uh, it's not a secret that the ITUR staff have been doing a lot of efforts when it comes to providing all possible facilities uh, to meeting participants. However, still there are a lot of challenges, and I hope by next year we will be able to meet uh, in physical meetings. That will solve a lot of the divergence in, in views uh, right now. 
for the C-band, I think the situation is uh, much less uh, complex, at least where you have ACMG countries and uh, SEPT have decided years, even before WRC, uh, to use uh, the 3.4, 3.8. Uh, for IMT, even in, in some cases uh, without IMT identification. Uh, I think there is a strong need, uh, if there is a strong need for uh, harmonization in a specific band, that may be even uh, done uh, in cases without a WRC decision. Uh, this is not the case for uh, the 6 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, the COVID pandemic has shown also some uh, emerging need to the band for uh, for Wi-Fi, uh, which increased the divergence of views on the future of the of the band. And certainly, the, there are a lot of uncertainty uh, associated with the conditions of using the band, given the existing services, especially as Eric mentioned, uh, satellite service. 4.8, I, I believe maybe the situation is, is more complex if you are following the discussion in uh, working party 5D and, and 5B, uh, a lot of divergent um, in, in views. Uh, so again, I hope we will be able to uh, meet physically. We've been able in the past to solve a lot of issues over uh, coffee break, and uh, I'm sure that will be uh, the situation again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Moving away from WRC23, um, where else can we get the capacity outside of 6 gigahertz? So wh where else could we look? Anyone? Well, I, I, I may just say that... that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll... Hello, can you hear me? Oh. Uh, yes, we can hear you, Mohammed. Yes, very good. I'll come later. Uh, that's okay, Massimiliano. Please go on. I think Mohammed is having some. Uh, the, the, I think that that uh, as you have shown with your with your slide before, uh, there are not so many, let's say, uh, real alternatives. If we talk about uh, mid range and we stick to one to six gigahertz as a uh, let's say a possible uh, range where we, we can look at. Uh, the alternative, uh, alternatives are very few, uh, at least alternatives of a certain where you can find uh, some the, uh, uh, en enough bandwidth available and not uh, uh, talking about just small slices as we are talking here about the evolution of 5G, therefore the, the uh, bandwidth of, uh, that will be needed will be higher. The, the, the only one would be, uh, the, the alternative would be the, the upper uh, uh, C-band and some some countries have decided to let's say to we are seeing some attempts to to uh, identify these bands for let's say local uh, applications. We we see some risk. We we uh, the, the the let's say the, the the risk that we see is that identify this identifying this band uh, for uh, that is one of the main uh, attractive band for uh, evolution of 5G. For local licenses, it's, it's, it's a waste of, of spectrum in our view. Uh, there are also ways of doing this and realizing also local licenses, but uh, let's say uh, this could, could happen in a complementary way. Uh, that is, it's, uh, we would like to avoid this kind of solution. Uh, and the fact that there are some also power limits could be probably uh, uh, overcome by uh, uh, the solutions that uh, that is uh, that is happening with exclusion zone in that areas as well, but the 3.842 is the only alternative uh, possibility. To to come back very quickly on the, on the WRC23 on the barriers, we believe that it's true that there are barriers. Uh, I would add that the the, the 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 problem that we that I see is that if we uh, give up uh, in trying to to let's say uh, break barriers and and provide solutions. Uh, we will end up in, with similar situations like the 28 gigahertz band, where the ITUR were, was not able at the, in the past to find out the solutions, and therefore the industry in some way, uh, let's say, proceeded in its own way. Uh, some countries proceeded uh, uh, without the endorsement of ITU, and 
Uh, this is something that we see uh, from from an harmonization point of view. Should we should try to avoid? Therefore, we should try to to uh, work together within the ITU framework. Absolutely, I think that's a very good point. Um, moving on a bit from that, but uh, what existing bands do you think could be used for 5G in your country or your footprint or your region? Uh, so that's CK here. Let me have a go at that. I think, um, well, of course, the first preference is to find fresh bands, uh, 3.5, 6 gigahertz. Uh, that's, that's fantastic if you can get it a uh, little bit on time. Uh, but the fallback is, of course, to refarm our existing 4G band. So uh, 2.6 is perhaps the most likely candidate, 2.3 as well. Uh, but the, of course, uh, having said that, these bands are quite, in fact, quite extensively used already in for 4G. So uh, it's expensive because uh, although we can put in DSS and all these uh, special technologies, it means that we are not, uh, we don't have full flexibility that we need if it's a new band. I just want to echo the, what Massimiliano said about the size of the, the bandwidth per band, right? For mobile operators, I think the more the most the more uh, the most stacks we have, 700, uh, 900, 1800, and the, we can sometimes you can find we're building networks that can have six or seven layers of uh, frequency bands. That is expensive. So I mean, if yeah, our preference is of course to find a block which has got large bandwidth. 300, 400, 500, 600 megahertz in one band, then we can, then we can apportion it uh, correctly. If we have small sliders in different stacks, it becomes very expensive in terms of a capex perspective. And that, that means that we can't deploy networks uh, as uh, affordable as possible. I yeah, hope, that, hope that helps. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you very much. Yes, Mohammed, please go ahead. Thank you, Louisiana. Uh, certainly there is a need for uh, 5G. We need a reliable uh, connection. I'm sorry, I've been disconnected several times, but just before this happened again, uh, while I will not focus on, on Egypt at the moment, but generally speaking, I think in many countries, the C-band should be on the top of, uh, of bands to be used for 5G uh, for several uh, reasons. And uh, as uh, was highlighted uh, in the poll uh, that was conducted today, firstly, it provides a good mix of uh, capacity and coverage and conditions of usage is relatively easier. Uh, it's uh, a lot of certainty when it comes to that band, at least uh, for the time being. Also, it's, it's, it's very obvious that the satellite industry have been migrating partially from a uh, bigger part of the C band to other bands, such as uh, KA and Q bands. And in many cases, 5G has emerged as uh, a good option for fixed wireless access. This comes in association with the decline of technologies previously using the band such as the YMAX. The problem with migrating from 4G to 5G perhaps is the absence of strong and affordable use cases for 5G, especially in, in, in developing countries coming from uh, one of them where the industry requirement may be less in, in, in developing countries uh, than those in the developed countries. And still 5G terminals are quite expensive. Now talking about existing IMT bands, uh, again, I think the pandemic has shown that in many countries, existing available assignment are not in use. And uh, at the start of the pandemic, several countries have assigned uh, temporary spectrum in, in, in a big uh, quantity, if I may say. And uh, in several cases, this uh, provides us a very question mark, why that spectrum is, is, is kept unused or why it's not used. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I think that's um, a very good point. And I think w w with the pandemic, we also see, um, we also have a big question mark with the FWAKs, which is something that we have addressed in our report. As CK mentioned, some, um, in, in some countries it's less relevant, in other countries it, it is more relevant. So do you see that, do, and all of you, do you see that significant pressure from FWA 5G in your markets, in your regions? Do you think that it could be an important component 
uh, on your market or you don't think that F 5G FWA is uh, is something that would be an issue for you? Uh, from from my side, maybe uh, I, I wanted to say that before, but the reality is that the response is, is no. Of course, there will be some uh, fixed wireless access uh, uh, services from from operators in 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 certain places, but that that will be a small part of of the um, of, of of the traffic from from the operator uh, due to the other way to provide the broadband connections. And 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 back to your earlier question, the 5G in in France, that's mainly the 3.5 gigahertz. It's really the primary band for 5G. One operator has also implemented the sharing between 4G and 5G into 700 megahertz. That can be mentioned. And, and the other band of, of big interest is the 2.1 gigahertz. And, and certainly because it's, I'm, I'm not an operator, so it would be up to them to say, but it, it's really in, in the context of, of refarming 3G into a 5G. Uh, when some other frequency band like the 2.6 gigahertz are, are really remaining uh, 4G, uh, LTE uh, because uh, their operators doesn't see the need uh, to uh, to refarm it from 4G to 5G or at least there's no no priority they want to keep this capacity for 4G for the time being because that's still where most of the terminals have the uh, capacity to to communicate. I think that's a very good point and I just wanted to point out that in the report uh, it is considered that all existing bands will become 5G eventually. So it's not that those that are being used for 2G, 3G, 4G are excluded for 5G. It is, it is considered that they will be 5G, but even on top of that, there is an additional need. Otherwise, we would be doing a worst case analysis, which is not, uh, not very positive. But I think that's a very good point. And uh, eventually, they will migrate. I, of course, CK raised some interesting points about the challenges of doing that. And... Uh, the balance between keeping your existing services, your existing um, co consumers, and then moving on into providing new services. And that is not new to the operators, of course, that happened uh, in all the evolutions that we have seen in the past, from 2G to 3G to 4G, and now to 5G, that is always the case. I don't think it, it, is, um, it is in any way new. But is anyone else interested in, in the uh, FWA question? I see Massimiliano asking, and then CK. Massimiliano, please. Yes, I'll try to be very, very brief. Uh, I have a different vision from, from uh, Eric's one. Uh, we, I believe that in the, in the coming years, FWA will be, uh, will be growing quite rapidly. Uh, I can speak, well, coming from a, a country where there is a lot of, uh, where we have a, let's say, border, mountainous border, uh, all over the northern part of Italy. Uh, and this area is the area that we are, uh, let's say uh, uh, fighting to to provide broadband access to fixed broadband access to, and I believe that uh, uh, in case of uh, if we do not if it, if we do not let's say uh, provide FWA solutions, the pressure uh, of a broadband connection would increase. We see that uh, the FWA could be a possibility of sol uh, to solve uh, ra more rapidly than the fiber solution that's very expensive. Uh, to provide broadband, uh, probably not comparable with the fiber, but uh, in any case, uh, broadband solutions that are uh, uh, satisfactory for the customers. Therefore, we, we see an increasing uh, pressure in the coming years. Thank you, Mainly in rural, in rural areas, mainly, but it, that's, that's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, CK, please go ahead. <clears throat> well, yeah, 5G FWA are very important because in uh, large, large parts of Asia where there's no fiber or fixed infrastructure, that uh, is only, the only, this is the only way to get up to those fiber-like speeds. It's actually quite, although we talk about it in theory, actually in this part of the world, it is quite, quite true. So um, the other point is that even in some countries where there is fiber infrastructure, like Australia, for example, I just read an article where uh, the MBN Co, the fiber provider actually finds that the, the mobile operator's 5G FW offerings is encroaching into their space. So that means there's competition and options, right? And I think competition is a very important driver for customers getting better service. So even though in some short, short answer, uh, developing countries, uh, 5G FW, very important. 
even in uh, developed countries where there's fiber infrastructure, you need it for competition purposes because you don't want you don't want, you want to give your consumers choice whether it's a through a fixed line or a, a wireless line. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mohammed, I don't know if you wanted to touch that. Yes, please go ahead, Mohammed. You're on mute, Mohammed. Sorry for that. So uh, thank you, uh, Luciana. Apparently, I'm, I'm interested in the influence of COVID-19 on, on our behavior. And on this, I, I would also disagree slightly with Eric. I think now there is uh, or there are new trends of spectrum use where wireless usage is more local and towards uh, suburban and, and rural areas. And due to the lack of mobility, and the uh, move of usage from business center uh, towards residential area, fixed wireless access seems a good solution, especially in, in developing countries where we cannot afford the optical fiber uh, everywhere. And given the emerging needs for applications of uh, such as e-learning and e-health, uh, which I personally expect after the end of the pandemic soon, such behavior uh, or use will stand still and, and, and continue. Uh, that's why I think fixed wireless access is a good option to focus on. I'm interested also in the flexibility provided in agenda items such as uh, 91C. Uh, this is something I guess we need to focus on uh, more. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. And I, I'll now turn to the question. We have, we've had a few questions. Uh, from the audience, uh, we have had, um, so the GISMA team has been responding to some specific questions about where to find the report and the slides and things like that. But there is one question that I thought might be interesting, especially for the operators or maybe even for Coleago if they, if they are available. Um, what is the turning point where network densification is no longer viable or sustainable and additional spectrum is required? Uh, this may be a key consideration for markets where high spectrum pricing is an issue. So, would anyone like to address the network densification densification issue? Well, I, I may start. Uh, if you if you don't have uh, any new spectrum uh, available, and uh, the densification will get to, to a certain level that you can, uh, let's say, uh, go further. The the, the the, the natural result will be that you, you will end up in a, a congested area, so the, the performance will be lowered. If you are not able to uh, increase the number of, of sites or uh, add, add additional layers in the existing sites to, to fulfill and, uh, the, 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 the growing the demand of tra for traffic, uh, the, the only thing that may happen is that uh, you will end up in, with a congested network, so the number of uh, requests of, of, of traffic uh, that are not uh, resolved will increase. Therefore, it, 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 it will, we will, uh, let's say, the, the, the position in the scoreboard of, uh, of, uh, of mobile operators will, uh, will decrease. I don't think there is another possibility for that. I don't see any other solution. Thank you very much. Stefan, would you like to add to, add to that? Uh, yeah. Um, so with increased, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. With increased densification, you're reaching technical limits. Uh, yes, you can densify further, but you then get interference problems. So the, the more you densify, the less you get out of each additional site you put, it, put in. And you combine that with a cost problem, you also have an economic problem. And as I already mentioned, the environmental problem in terms of power consumption. So all of these factors really mean that there are limits to densification. You can't densify your way out of the area traffic demand problem in cities. You do need spectrum. Right. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think that is um, a really important point. We have published in the GSMA the coverage report, which shows that um, even though most of the world population live within mobile coverage, uh, the gap is actually that people cannot access it. 
because of prices. So this is an important point uh, to make the networks more expensive will not help the digital divide. We will actually in, 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 in decrease the situation, we will actually make it worse. But I would like to thank the panelists very much for joining me today. It's great seeing you all, uh, all dear friends, long-term friends, and uh, it's all good. I, I wish we could see you face to face, but maybe hopefully soon we will. And uh, it, is, it, it is a pleasure having you all here. I would like to thank you very, very, very much. And going back to our poll, we had our second poll is was ongoing. So ending this poll, uh, the question was, how will 5G FWA impact your market? And the, um, the winning answer was as competition for fiber-based connections everywhere. So it's a bit of point of what was made in the panel. Competition is good. Competition makes, um, th th that's what made this service. We also had a very high level of answers for only as a complementary service. So yes, we don't, we don't believe that, um, 5G FWA will be, will take over and, um, 5G will do absolutely everything. My old boss at my uh, old job at Anatel used to say, IMT thinks they can do everything. They can even serve coffee. Uh, yes, we cannot serve coffee. We cannot do absolutely everything. But it's good to be complementary and it's good to have competition. So I think those two answers highlight this situation very well. And again, uh, our report is the Coleago report, which the GCMA has commissioned, is now available, is now online. And also the policy considerations that uh, my colleague Lohan has explained. It's also online. I would invite everyone to come and, and download and have a look. <coughs> Get in touch with us if you have any questions on the report or on the policy considerations. This presentation, uh, this webinar will also be posted online. And uh, by end, um, do get in touch if you have any questions or comments. And it's been a pleasure being with you here today. So thank you very, very, very much again to the panelists and have a lovely day. Thank you, Luciana. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks.